This presentation is about COVID-19 virus stability and transmission. My name is Kelly Grindrod. I'm a pharmacist and I'm an associate professor at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. COVID-19 research is rapidly evolving. There's limited research available and the information presented is based on the research to date. Today is March 30th, 2020 and may change as new information emerges. There's two main questions for this presentation. The first is how long does the COVID-19 virus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus survive on surfaces? The second question is how is COVID-19 transmitted between people? In terms of how the COVID-19 virus is spread, when you look at the World Health Organization situation reports, they release one every day. On March 26, 2020, they released one that actually talked about the spread of the virus. And they said in it, available evidence indicates that COVID-19 virus is transmitted during close contact through respiratory droplets, such as coughing and by fomites. So what's meant by respiratory droplets? You can catch the COVID-19 virus when someone coughs, sneezes, or breathes near your eyes, nose, or mouth, or on a surface that you touch, and then you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. So in the World Health Organization's document on infection prevention and control, which was updated last March 19th, 2020, for respiratory droplets, they recommend using contact and droplet precautions, uh, which is our number of things that are done in hospital related to things like uh, how far apart beds are, etc. Hand hygiene, so making sure you're washing with soap and water or alcohol hand sanitizers when soap and water are not available, making sure hands are washed when they're visibly soiled as well. They also recommend respiratory hygiene, which is covering your nose and mouth with a tissue or your elbow when you're coughing and sneezing and putting masks on people who are suspected of, uh, suspected of having COVID because when they can cough or sneeze, they would produce droplets. Um, so making sure that's contained. And of course, early recognition and isolation of cases is key. The WHO document talked about respiratory droplets, but they also talked about fomites. So what's a fomite? A fomite's an object that can be contaminated with the virus and this allows the virus to spread. So examples of fomites are things like doorbells, handrails, keyboards, stethoscopes, and clothing. These are all inanimate objects that the virus could get on and then someone else could touch it, pick it up on their hands, and then touch their eyes, their nose, or their mouth. We should also mention aerosols though. So there is some question about whether this is spread through aerosols, specifically aerosolizing procedures like tracheal intubation, non-invasive ventilation, tracheotomy, cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR, manual ventilation before intubation and bronchoscopy. To manage aerosols specifically, the World Health Organization recommends strategies such as adequate ventilation or negative pressure rooms, particulate respirators like N95 masks with a seal check, eye protections like goggles and face protection, gowns and gloves, and limiting the number of people in the room during these types of procedures. So back to our questions, the first one is how long does the COVID-19 virus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus survive on surfaces? So let's start by looking at this study which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on March 17th. It's a letter to the editor describing aerosol and surface stability of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus causing COVID-19, as compared with the SARS-CoV-1 virus. So this was a lab study. And specifically what they were looking at is, is how stable the virus was on different kinds of surfaces. So in this lab studies, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was detectable on the following surfaces. So for plastic, it was detectable after 72 hours, so about three days. For stainless steel, it was detectable after 48 hours, so about two days. And for cardboard, it was detectable after about 24 hours, so one day, and copper about four hours. They also did a procedure where they aerosolized it in the lab and they found that it was in the aerosols for about three hours. But there's a caution here that this doesn't actually replicate real world aerosolizing type procedures. So that's not as informative as some of the other stuff. Now this letter was quite useful because we don't really have a lot of information about the COVID virus. But what we did learn from this was that it was stable on surfaces and it depended on the type of, of material that you've got. Now this was simulated though in a lab environment. So while it tells us the virus is on those surfaces, it doesn't necessarily tell us how long those viruses are viable and, and how long those viruses could cause or, or could lead to an infection in a person if they were to touch that surface, for example, and then touch their eyes, their nose, or their mouth. 
The US CDC also published uh, this report in the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report on March 26 about COVID-19 and cruise ships. And specifically in here, they actually referred to some communication that they'd have around how long the virus det was detectable in some of the rooms of cruise ship passengers. And this made some headlines because what they, what they reported was that the viral RNA was actually detectable on the surfaces in cabins of both symptomatic and asymptomatic infected passengers up to 17 days after cabins were vacated. And this was specifically in the Diamond Princess cruise ship, but before disinfection procedures had been conducted. Now, a number of people have, have drawn attention to the fact that this was actually through personal communication. So there isn't a lot of information around how they did this testing. Further, this report cautions, although these data cannot be used to determine whether transmission occurred from contaminated surfaces, further study of fomite transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus aboard cruise ships is warranted. So what this was showing, or the take home here, was that there was virus present in symptomatic and asymptomatic infected passengers. So people who didn't know that they were infected with the, the COVID virus still were producing virus that could be detected after quite some time in the rooms. What we don't know is how long that virus was viable for. So it's unlikely it was viable for 17 days, but it, we know that it at least was there in the rooms even of asymptomatic people. So what's the answer to the question, how long does the COVID-19 virus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus survive on surfaces? Based on the information we've got right now, it may live on surfaces for hours to days. We don't really know how long, and it can be spread by symptomatic and asymptomatic people. Now, knowing what we know about how long it survives on surfaces, or what little we know about how it survives on surfaces, the next question is, how is the COVID-19 virus actually transmitted to people? So something that's really interesting to look at with this COVID virus or viruses like this is uh, cluster tracking. So there's a number of studies that actually look at how the virus sp spreads between people, families, etc. So the first one we'll look at is uh, tracking clusters in China. So this was published in The Lancet in, on January 24th, and it's specifically looking at a family cluster. So this particular family had six people in it. These were people who flew from Shenzhen, China to Wuhan, China to, to visit family. And this was in late December, early January. So after there were cases of COVID, but it wasn't uh, well known, the, the knowledge of this wasn't widespread. So this family were visiting local family in Wuhan every day. They didn't have a history of eating in the food markets where we know that the virus likely originated from. And this whole family stayed at the same hotel, that the six members who traveled together in two separate rooms. And there were small children, parents, and older people. Now, the family that, that was found to have COVID, they were actually, it was, it's thought that they possibly caught it when they were visiting a family member in the hospital in Wuhan. So there was a one-year-old who had gone to the hospital for an infection along with a parent. This visiting family who had flown in from Shenzhen, a couple of the members actually went to the hospital and visited this child. And it's thought that on that trip to the hospital, they picked it up. Then they went back to their hotel and were staying with the family that they traveled with. And by the time that they were traveling home to Shenzhen after a little less than a week, the symptoms started showing up and it, it was shown that this virus was transmitted through the family. So the, the China tracking in the study we just looked at really showed how it moves through families. But there's another interesting study here that looks at clusters in Singapore. And this specifically looks at three different clusters and it moved through these three clusters in slightly different ways. So the first cluster in Singapore had 11 people in it. And there were at least two Chinese tour group members who were on this tour group, and they were traveling around Singapore. And they went into a complimentary health product store. They spent about 30 minutes there. And four employees were later found to be infected with COVID. Similarly, they went to a jewelry store. They spent about an hour there, and one employee was found to be infected. Now, what's interesting is um, when they, there were two members of this tour group who were found to have COVID-19, but there were a number of other members who were, were reported to be coughing when they were on this trip as well. So it's possible that a number of members of that tour group had COVID-19. 
When they went to the complimentary health store, the employees were called um, putting tester products on, on the bodies of the tour group members, for example, and they didn't wash their hands in between uh, customers that they were helping, for example. So you saw four employees getting infected, and as with the jewelry store, presumably there was some direct touching, maybe putting on of jewelry, and you got one employee infected. This also later led to household infections for one of the employees who then went home and passed it on to their family members. And this is just an image showing you that uh, how this virus spreads. So you've got the visit to the shop at the beginning and it starts with a 48 year old female and a 39 year old male. And then it moves throughout this group um, infecting the employees and then eventually infecting the family members of one employee. The next cluster in Singapore had 20 people in it, and this was specifically a business meeting of 111 people from 19 countries that took place in Singapore. Seven of the meeting attendees were from China, including one from Wuhan. So there were six attendees who were found to have COVID-19 who didn't have any travel history prior to this, um, around the time they were testing positive for COVID-19. So when they went back and looked at the conference, they found that there had been business presentations, workshops, breakout meetings, welcome receptions, meals, team building activities, and a city bus tour. They also found that four of the cases who tested positive for COVID-19 had sat with attendees from China at at least one banquet meal. So um, the, the seven folks from China were separated between a couple of tables, and so these attendees were sitting at these various tables. And also four of the cases were in a breakout session with the attendees from China as well, including the same attendees as the meal. Now, when they returned home, they then passed on the family contacts in Malaysia and France. And of note, no hotel staff were actually infected in this particular cluster, and they did monitor them for that. And so what you see here again is the exposure at the conference. And so you've got your individuals who are infected early on, um, some eventually passing it on to family members as well. Now the third cluster is of particular interest. So there were five people in this cluster. It seems to have started with two Chinese nationals who had traveled from Wuhan to Singapore, a husband and wife, and they went to a church service. And they, they sat in this morning service, they were asymptomatic. Now, two people who later tested positive with COVID-19 uh, didn't seem to have any contact with these two Chinese nationals. But what they did find is when they went back and looked at the recordings, because there's CT CCTV cameras uh, in the church, they could actually see that the individuals who tested positive for COVID later had actually sat in the same seats as the two Chinese nationals had sat in that morning. So, you know, the, the Chinese nationals had sat in the seats in the morning and then later on the same day, two individuals sat on those seats and were later found to have COVID-19, suggesting that there could be some environmental transmission there. And here you can see that they, they originally went to the visit at church and then you have the first three testing positive and then you have the next two later on testing positive. So COVID-19 is new to us. But we actually have some precedents because the SARS outbreak happened in 2003 and there were some similar cluster analyses or cluster tracking that happened at that point. So here's a study from 2004 published in Emerging Infectious Diseases that looks at three different clusters that emerged around a hospital emergency room. So what you see here is at the top you have the first cluster, in the middle you have the second cluster, and on the bottom you have a couple of arrows that represent the third cluster. So in the first cluster, you had a, they had a patient who showed up at the emergency department who was later found out to have SARS. Now that person had actually been at a different hospital previously that had had an outbreak. So that's presumably where they picked up or were exposed to SARS. So they show up at this hospital emergency department. And from that person being in the emergency department, they were able to track three patients who became infected and two nursing aides who became infected. About a week later, they had the next cluster. So a woman who had cared for her mother in the emergency department around the time of that first cluster came back to the emergency department with symptoms of SARS. From her, she, uh, there were another six patients who were then infected, three family members and five nursing aides. Now after this, there was uh, about a week or so later, 12 healthcare workers then tested positive for SARS or then contracted SARS. Interestingly, six had had direct contact with SARS patients, but six had not. And they actually didn't have a lot of overlap in terms of the jobs they did or where they worked. 
So what they concluded is that most cases of SARS in this case were from close patient contact, presumably by droplet transmission. Now six of the healthcare worker cases had no direct SARS patient contact, so it was possibly from commonly used contaminated objects. And when they went back and actually tested various surfaces, they found that the virus was on the button of the water fountain, bedside chair, central air supply outlet, tabletop, bedding, bed edge, and bookshelf. So the SARS-CoV RNA, so this is SARS-CoV-1 RNA, was found on these commonly used inanimate objects. But they also noted that although the signal only demonstrated that the viral RNA was there and not a viable virus, this finding may indicate that the virus can persist in the environment. So just like now where we have these questions with COVID, we had similar questions back then with SARS as well. And this is critical. So in this study, this is what they concluded. Masks do not prevent acquisition from environmental sources. They also said the spread of SARS was most likely facilitated by lack of proper hand washing, then by direct contact with patients or environments contaminated with viral nucleic acid. The importance of hand washing cannot be overemphasized. So back to our question, how is COVID-19 transmitted to people? Well, based on the research done to date, we know it goes through households. We know it also goes through direct contact, so through those respiratory droplets, for example. And it appears to be spreading through fomites, so inanimate objects that the virus can be on that you can then touch, pick up on your hands, and touch your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and get infected. So how do we stay safe? So proper infection control is key, lots of hand washing, etc. Um, also using tissues or your elbow when you cough or sneeze and making sure those tissues go directly into the garbage and making sure you never touch your nose, your mouth or your eyes with unwashed hands. So there have been a lot of questions around what this means for things like what about my groceries and what about my clothing and what about my purse when I'm at work and we're seeing pharmacists are very concerned when patients self-select a cough syrup for example and then it has to be wrung into the till you know what happens if I touch that surface. Regardless of all of those things one of the biggest take-home messages we're getting from infectious disease experts and microbiologists and all sorts of other people is that you must wash your hands. The most important way you can protect yourself from this is to wash your hands. And finally, in terms of cleaning, there are a couple of things to consider. So make sure that you're washing frequently touch surfaces like doorknobs, handrails, elevator buttons, light switches, cabinet handles, faucet handles, tables, countertops, electronics. And this matters when you're at the workplace. This matters if you're somewhere that has a bit more traffic. This might be in your own home, especially if you have someone who is isolating on another floor away from the rest of the family or trying to prevent that transmission, as many healthcare workers who are living with their families are concerned about doing. Having a, a, a regimen where a lot of these things are disinfected regularly could be quite helpful. In terms of what to clean with, so regular household cleaners should be good. Uh, Health Canada recommends regular household cleaners or a solution of diluted bleach with one teaspoon of bleach per one cup of water. They also caution against using drinking alcohol, witch hazel or essential oils as cleaners because they're unlikely to work. And finally, to wash your hands for 20 seconds with water, using alcohol hand sanitizers when soap and water is not available, and being very careful about homemade hand sanitizers. It's difficult to get the right amount of alcohol in them, so generally they should be avoided unless a very specific recipe is used, such as one provided by the World Health Organization.